Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Sunday School Extra for Akron Alliance Fellowship Church in Akron, Ohio for Sunday, October the 15th, 2023. We appreciate you being here today. My name is Melvin Gaines. We're going to go ahead and get into the lesson today. <clears throat> that is essentially a lesson in reference to prayer. And we have been focusing on prayer for the past few weeks uh, during Sunday school and even during the recent um, Second Wednesday Bible study as well, too. But prayer just seems to be a very important subject for matters of faith in the church community and even specifically in our church community. But I want you to hopefully the the spirit will speak to you about this matter of prayer and faith and how indeed James says it all when he uh, is closing out his epistle in the book of James chapter 5 verses 13 through 20 about the importance of effectual prayer and implementing prayer as a daily uh, part of your entire lifestyle and I think that's what we want to take away from what's happening uh, what we'll be looking at here today in the passage. So let's go ahead and get into it, and let's start by looking to the Lord with a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for this time that you've given to us to sit quietly now and hear the Spirit speak to us about what you want to say to us about matters of prayer and focusing on this relationship that we have with you. Lord, we indeed would not be able to accomplish anything without you. And we know that prayer is an important part of that. Lord, speak to us about how we pray, how we go about prayer, and help us as we move forward in a world today where it's the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who have to set the example for others in the world today and be that reflection of you as we move forward. We give you praise and thanks for the opportunities that we have to do this and to be mindful of our relationship with you too. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody, we're going to be covering uh, the book of James, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. Please turn your Bibles and electronic devices to James, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. This particular section in the epistle of James is going to be talking about where do we get genuine wisdom from? It comes from prayer. It comes from the words of God and praying to him as we have that understanding of who he is. And it requires faith because we are usually praying for something that we are looking for a result on or looking for a solution about. And so the prayer of faith is the subject here. And we have to be mindful of how God is going to look at every person, every individual and look at their lifestyle and what they have to that shows for their lifestyle. And so we need to be mindful of what we do as we give an account. And we give an account in many ways, even through the prayer life that we have as well, too. Let's read the passage and we'll go back over it. James chapter 5, verse 13. So let's start there. And again, this is the last section of the book of James altogether. Uh, and it's a good way to close out what he teaches about this purpose of living, um, the words that we have, faith through works. And that's what he represents here. But let's take a look at it more closely. Verse 13. This is the New Living Translation. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Verse 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, 
none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Okay, that's James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. And I think what we have to look at here too, um, and I, I mentioned this very briefly at the beginning here, Believers do have a responsibility to make sure that we are living in the best possible way we can in service for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I say that, I'm, it means that we need to be complete. As the spirit that fills us makes us complete, we need to take advantage of that and live in that manner before others. Because at the end of the day, we all have to give an account for how we live as believers. And we, we have to give an account, we, and we, let's be very clear about this, everybody is going to have to account for their lives. Whether you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or whether you don't, there's going to be an accounting of, of what you're doing. And I, I couldn't help but look at, I'm going to have you turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37. One of the things that we as believers have to do is speak plainly, speak truthfully, speak honestly, and live according to those words we speak. And not be double-minded, not live in such a manner where we are doing things that are outside of God's will. Because there's going to be an accounting for that. Now, this isn't meant to be something that, that is like saying, oh, you better do this or else. I mean, you should want to do this. You should want to live in such a manner where... You're speaking plainly, and you're not pretending, for example, like in church, to pray out loud for something that just to get just to get for show, or posting something on social media just for clicks. You're doing it because it's you. It's you being sincere. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. I tell you, on that day, that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. And that's specifically talking about the tree uh, and its fruit. Uh, living out according to the fruits of the Spirit. And living in such a manner where you're honoring the Lord Jesus Christ in what you do. Because your words do matter. How you go about your business does matter. So F.B. Meyer asked the question, how should we act in any given situation? And James is saying, be yourself. Be perfectly natural. Be the person that you are, that God created you to be. And so now we need to get back to what does that really mean? Well, it means to certainly take care of yourself but also look after others. Do the things that you were created to do. Take care of yourself, but look after others. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's how we're supposed to live. And so when we talk about praying, back to verse 13, because this is what we have to have this empathy that is really, really important when it comes to being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Now, James is mentioning this, this in the same passage. He's giving prayer and praise equal footing. Why is he doing that? Because that's who we are. That's who we should be as a people. We should be prayerful people and we should be people ready to make praises to the Lord for what he's done for us. So there's equal billing here. Prayer and praise. If you're happy, sing praises. Sing for joy. If you are suffering hardships, you should be prayerful. It's less likely that you'll feel joy at that moment. But at the same time, 
look what God has done for you. And at the same time, maybe you'll even give him praise. Maybe you'll say thank you for where you are. But this is about taking this mindset off of yourself and off of your flesh and now looking more at the good things that you do have in the relationship you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer and praise have equal billing here. And when we are suffering, when we are going through a hard time, the sick are to confess their sins and call for prayers from the believers, prayers from the people in the body of Christ to pray for that person. And we're going to look at oil. Let's look at look at verse 14. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. What does oil really represent here? Oil represents the Holy Spirit. It's the symbol of the Spirit. The body is the Holy Spirit's temple. And there is something about how this oil is a representation of the Spirit. It's a representation of the Spirit uh, both in the medical sense and in the spiritual sense. We, we'll talk about that a little bit more later here uh, because of what it was used for even back when we read about it in uh, the accounts in Scripture. But we want to make sure that we're understanding that this prayer in the spirit, this prayer of prayer of faith is really, really important for us to inherit and just continue to use as a lifestyle for our lives, this prayer of faith. We should be praying continually. First Thessalonians 5, 18, or 5, chapter 5, praying continually, seeking the Lord continually. Uh, in his word. And I want to make sure that we are always doing that. And this prayer is so important. When we're talking about, are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. We're talking about someone who's really physically ill, someone who's sick to the degree that um, you are relying upon the Lord to hear the prayer and answer that prayer for healing. It's a prayer of faith. And, but I don't want you to miss something here that's very important that James says here in the passage as well too. Um, and we have to understand that while it's important for us to be physically healed, the Lord is actively healing us spiritually. Let's look at verse 15 again. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Now, let's be very clear about something here, too. Physical healing does require compliance with God's will. Spiritual healing is something he does instantaneously. If we commit sins and we acknowledge those sins and give them to the Lord, you will be forgiven. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That's very clear because that's the very nature of how we have fellowship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sins will be forgiven immediately. Physical healing, it may take some time and it has to be in accordance with God's will. But he's faithful. And when he says that the prayers of the righteous have great results, which we'll look at in verse 16, he means that. So all of our prayers are prayers of faith for healing or a change to some situation or circumstance in our lives. But God won't deny those things to us if, they're fit, in, if they fit in his will. He will provide those things for us. He just calls on us to have this mindset this lifestyle to be seeking him in prayer all the time not just praying when it's convenient for you or not just praying for for example because you've done everything else outside of the will of god but now you want to to turn to him for a last second gesture trying to fix things and it doesn't mean that he won't do that but that's not really what he wants us to do he wants us to live naturally be perfectly natural, calling on 
other believers to pray on your behalf, recognizing the work of the Spirit in your life. He wants us to live in a manner that helps make us more complete as we rely upon the Spirit. That's what he wants us to do. And at the end of the day, we all want to be healthy. We all want to live in a healthy manner. But it's much more important, whether we have physical ailments or not, that we are living spiritually healthy, that we're living in a relationship with Jesus Christ and trusting in this healing that he gives to us. But we are relying upon the faith, a gift that God gives to us to help us in this relationship with him. And so I think we need to see that too. In verses 14 and 15 about any, if any of you are sick, you should call for the elders of the church to come and pray. He's referring to somebody who is spiritually ill. Um, excuse me, physically ill. Sorry about that. Referring to someone who is physically ill. Of course, all of us at some point are spiritually ill at some point, And we have to rely upon prayer for that as well, too. But here, calling on the elders to pray means someone's physically ill. And in scripture, oil was both a medicine and let's take a look at Luke chapter 10. I want to give you an example about this medicine part because we sometimes don't really quite understand what oil does bring to the table here and when we talk about praying with someone over someone with oil. It means two different things. But let's look at the example in Luke chapter 10. And it's going to be in the section about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the expert in the law is testing Jesus and asking questions. And he has already told essentially what we read about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And then verse 29, wanting to justify himself, this, 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 <laughs> this person who's asking Jesus questions, who is my neighbor? Let's read verse 30 through 37. Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up and fled, leaving him half dead. Verse 31, a priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him pass by on the other side. These are two people, a priest and a Levite. You have to assume they are Israelites, but yet they walk right by this guy. Verse 33, but a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. That's the reference to oil we're referring to. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him into an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. When I come back I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the ruler said, The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, Go and do the same. So we're seeing an example here of how oil was used to help take care of the wounds of the man who was beaten and left for dead. But it was also used as an oil in anointing kings. In the examples in 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 to 13, we won't read that. But oil represents both the medical and spiritual spheres of life. Now, why is this important? Christians are not to separate the two. We don't separate the physical and the spiritual. Jesus Christ is both Lord over the body and the spirit. It's a completeness that we need to recognize here when we talk about prayer and the purposes of using oil. The oil has a twofold purpose for what we're looking at here. And it's a representation of the spirit. When we're talking about anointing someone with oil or rubbing something on their head for the purposes of that, 
we want that person to recognize the importance of what the Spirit is doing in them and what the Spirit represents for all of us as well, too. And so this prayer and this union of prayer, pray over them anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. And look what it says again in verse 15. Uh, back to James chapter 5, verse 15. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. So we need to be able to rely upon the believers in the church. They're not living on islands. We're all together. We're supposed to be operating in the spirit. We're supposed to be counting on each other's for support and for prayer. One of the things our church does, we have a, uh, a way of sending text messages to all the members of the church when it's time to pray for someone. It's a wonderful thing. You know, we uh, a lot of us need to do a better job, I think, of embracing some technologies. Um, I'm not going to pick on any one person about that, but, you know, if you've got a telephone and you can text somebody, you can pray for somebody, too, by sending text messages and greetings back and forth and let people know instantaneously when there's a matter of prayer that has to take place. And we need to make sure that we're using those resources that we have. We need to make sure we're using the resources in the spirit, relying upon Jesus Christ and also relying upon the body of believers. We should call on the elders to respond to the illness of any member, which makes perfect sense. And the church needs to be, here's the thing, be sensitive to the needs of other members. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. We just went through the reading. Who's the neighbor? Well, it's that person that you may not know. It may be a next door neighbor. It may be somebody across the street. It may be somebody where you used to live that you have as neighbors, somebody that you've kept in contact with. These are all the people that we need to be sensitive to. And we need to be sensitive to them, whether believers, whether they are believers in Jesus or not. How is the light of Christ going to shine in this world today? It's got to come from believers. And we're living in an age of grace. And we need to understand that in this age of grace, the Spirit is available for anybody who chooses to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and comes and dwells within us. And that's how we need to be praying for others. And... We are praying for healing for others, healing spiritually too as well, not just physically, healing for their very souls. And that's what we have to be sensitive to here. Prayer is a part of God's healing process, not just physically, but spiritually. I, I have to confess, I'm looking at this a little bit differently. I went over the study before, but I don't want you to neglect the spiritual healing that takes place. We have to make sure that we are praying for people just so that they get well. But that's a mindset that we have, recognizing that God is the one who does the healing. He's the one that does the healing, physically and spiritually. We can't heal anyone on our own accord. It has to be God working through us. God is the one who is working through these prayers that we have that provides the healing. And here's why I'm, I'm emphasizing this. It's very important. We're talking about physical healing and how God does that. But let's go back to verse 16 in James chapter 5. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now this centers back on you and me. We need to make sure that we, if we are having a, a solid relationship with Jesus Christ, that we're confessing our sins to him and praying for forgiveness. That's something that we can do immediately. And before, when we get before the Lord, we want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to throw off those sins that take us away from fellowship with the Lord and put on the full armor of God. And making sure that we're living in that manner to withstand anything that comes our way. Um, that's the lifestyle that we have to live. A lifestyle of being repentant 
asking for God's forgiveness and he does it immediately. I'm emphasizing this because we have to make sure that we're understanding, yes, we can pray for others in the church, but we need to be praying for ourselves too. We need to have a, a mindset of repentance as well. And there are some comments here that are being made. If we've sinned against an individual, we have to ask him or her to forgive us. Is there somebody that you've done something to that you know isn't right, but you haven't made it right? You need to go to the person. Even if the person doesn't even realize what you're talking about, go to the person. Ask for forgiveness. If the sin has affected our church, we are to confess that openly, publicly, and making sure that others recognize that as well, too. How do they know how to pray for you if you don't do those things? Not about telling all your business, but if you're sinning against someone and you know where the target is, you need to deal with that. And, you know, humility is something that a lot of people lack. You know, there are people who will never admit when they're wrong, when they've clearly done things wrong, but they won't admit it. Well, where is the, where is the humility in that? How do you think God sees that behavior? Go back to what I said earlier. Be perfectly natural. Don't be fake. Be natural. Live in such a manner where you're honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. If we need loving support as we struggle with sin, confess the sin to those who are able to provide the support. In other words, get to with people who will make you accountable, will help you with the accountability. Maybe you've had addictions in your past. Maybe you've had things that you've done uh, that you need accountability for. Well, that's perfectly fine in the body of Christ. That's what we're here for. We're here for support. We're not here to make judgments. We're here to su be supportive. We will share truth. We will speak truth. But at the end of the day, we're here to provide support. And we need to trust that what we do as we go to the Lord for forgiveness, that he is going to indeed forgive us. We live in a time and a place in the body of Christ where all believers have to be accountable to each other. Why? Because we are a part of this priestly group of people. We're a priest to other believers. Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter. This is really after the book of James, by the way. Chapter 2. And I'm going to read from verse 9. First Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen and praise the Lord that we have God's mercy. He wants us to live in that same manner, having mercy for others, having forgiveness for others, adopting the very lifestyle that he has for us. Because in Christ's kingdom, every believer is a priest to other believers. And that's what he wants you to see here too. You have rights. You have abilities that God has, has given to you that we need to make sure we're exercising. And we're not, we're not to neglect prayer. We're not to neglect others. We are to have a genuine concern for other people who profess to know God but are not living that way. 
And we'll get to that later in this passage because we need to see and understand that because you, you have a responsibility. If you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are part of a royal priesthood. You are part of a holy nation. You are a group of people who has the power and the ability through prayer and believing and trusting in God, uh, praying according to his will, you can do anything in Christ if those conditions are being met. But many of us abdicate our responsibility. We don't live that way. We don't think that way. We don't do that. We think very selfishly more often than we should. And I think that that's what we have to see here. And I love how uh, even James tells us in this passage, go to verse 17. This is really cool. If you really look at this for what it is, because you would think of Elijah as being this amazing, superhuman type of a person. When we look at him in scripture, that's not who he was at all. James chapter 5, verse 17, Elijah was as human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. What a weather man he was. <laughs> and so verse 18, then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. Now, what's the point I'm trying to make here? Prayer is powerful, but we have that ability. Elijah was as human as we are. He wasn't anybody special. He had ability because God gave it to him. He certainly spoke, you know, on one hand, he was doing amazing things and speaking before the Lord. But on the other hand, he was terrified running away from Jezebel. He was just like we are. We have failings. We have successes. We, we, we have moments where we are giving God praise. And we have moments when we are not at our best. But yet we have this amazing ability that we can do great things if we just go and use the abilities we have in prayer and maintain our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we have to come back to. It's, it's really a great teaching here. And we have a great resource of communion with God in prayer. Elijah is showing us this based upon the example that was given here. Prayer should never be a last resort. Prayer should never be a last resort. It's not something we do when all else fails. It doesn't work that way. Now, God can do whatever he desires to do. We know that God's power is much more greater than ours, infinitely greater. Let's just tell it like it is. So why are you not relying upon God's power all the time? Why would you wait until the last minute to pray for something as if it's an act of desperation? Acts of desperation typically don't work. God is waiting to see what your life can be in its completeness by praying to him in the beginning and through to the end, not just when you think you should pray. God wants us to pray continually, continually. And that's what he is calling us to do. And I want to make sure that I yeah, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is to pray constantly. I think I said 5.18. But 5.18 does have application. Give thanks in everything for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So you give thanks while you're praying. And I want to make sure I quoted the verse properly. Because I made, it made me think about that while I was talking. But pray continually and give thanks while you're doing so. That's a lifestyle. That's a lifestyle for all of us. It's not often I get to correct something when I actually say it, but I'm glad I was able to do that. Elijah wasn't a superman. He was subject to the same passions as we are, but he prayed with passion. And that's the kind of prayer we need today. Prayers with passion. Um, 
every now and then I'll say, you know, it's good to write down what to pray for. Make a journal, whether it's a written journal or electronic journal, whatever it is. But these are things that bring to mind the importance of certain situations, certain people, the lives, lives that they're living. Praying for the lost. Make a list. Remembering those people in prayer all the time. This is why a prayer ministry is so important. This is why we've been emphasizing prayer now for quite some time. Because we don't always know quite who to pray for and how to pray for them. And you don't, you, you can pray on your own and make a list of, of, of names of people to pray for. But we also need to be praying as a community. That's what James is talking about right here. Come and pray over you. Call the elders of the church. Pray and confess your sins with one another. Pray for each other. That's community prayer. And I love the words, the earnest prayer of a righteous person. Righteous person, meaning that you've taken your sins and given them to the Lord, and he makes you righteous because of the relationship that you have with him. But it starts with you and expands out to the body of believers. And let's get back to verse 19. A very important point here I want to make at the end here. Because when I talk about praying for those who don't know Jesus, they may profess they believe God, believe in who God is, but they don't necessarily believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life. So verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you, James chapter 5, verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. What are we talking about here? People who have fallen away. People who have wandered from the truth. It may be a believer who's fallen into sin, but we need to be careful not to assume that every person who talks about God is a believer in Jesus, a complete believer in Jesus as Lord and Savior. It may refer to both. We're not talking about whether a person loses their salvation. We're talking about making sure that a person is saved Period. Praying for that person to return, fall away from those things that the flesh is making them do. We're making this effort here talking about praying, taking your sins and confessing to the church, confessing to one another. We want other people to recognize the importance of doing this too. Confessing your sins, asking for healing in prayer. And that's what we want to make sure that we are implementing in our own lifestyle as well, too. We as believers need to make sure we're obedient to God's commands and love one another. That's what we're called to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another. Don't be critical. Don't be judgmental. Speak the truth in love. Pray for those people who are in trouble who need to repent. James is telling Christians here in verses 19 and 20 to help backsliders return to God. <laughs> Pray for the person, act in love, and that will be what God will respond to those prayers. The Spirit will do the work to make sure that person has an impact and returns directly back to God. And that's what we want to emphasize here. We have to be the example of heaven on earth as believers in Jesus Christ. James is telling us this, the prayer of faith. Be the example of heaven on earth. We want to draw people to Christ through our love for God, our love for each other. That's why prayer is important, though. 
in order for us to be at our best and live day by day in Christ, we need to be prayerful day after day in Christ in what we're doing. I hope you can see this. God's word is not merely something we just read about or think about, but something we do. That's right. Faith without works is dead. We have to live it out. We have to act it out. We have to seek the Lord each day. He wants us to do these things. He wants us to be in effectual prayer. He wants us to seek him. And I love how James says at the end, wandering, bringing the sinner back from wandering saves that person from death. Saves them from death because we have to make an assumption here that we don't want anybody to die spiritually. They're going to die physically one day. No question, right? But forgiveness of sins comes from what? Repentance. And even others observing a person coming from that place will get them to think about where they are in Christ. And more sins will be forgiven because they repent and turn to the Lord. All good things happen when we're praying this way. We want to bring sinners back. We want to get sinners to take this thing about faith seriously. Faith in Jesus Christ. Be natural. When you're sick, when you're having hardship, you pray. If you're happy, you sing praises. You say thank you. God has to teach us this lifestyle. We have to have the desire to live it and serve him in this manner. I hope you can see this. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your presence. Thank you for the teaching of how we are to live in the spirit, how we are to pray as believers, how we're to think outside of ourselves and rely upon you. We thank you for showing us how much you love us because you forgive us instantaneously when we turn and give our sins to you. Lord, we thank you for the lessons that you have taught us here about the importance of prayer and coming to you as we are. Not in some fake way, but to be genuine. And we thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me for this Sunday School Extra for Sunday, October the 15th, 2023. God bless you. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next time.